to all of you who were brave and sober and not hungover enough to get here at this hour of the morning. I'm Marsha Pally from New York University, and I will be moderating this panel, which we're going to conduct by just taking people in the order in which you find them in your program. Each person will come up and speak for 15 minutes. Um, after which my timer will make an unpleasant noise, and you will have to sit down. At the end, we'll take questions and um, for the entire panel at the end, so we make sure that every speaker gets an adequate amount of time to speak. So if you have a question, jot it down, reserve it um, for the end, and we'll have all speakers gather at the front, and you can dodge your pen um, at the end. Um, so our first speaker is Jodan Zhang, um, also from New York University, kicking off our morning with Constitution making perpetualized. Okay, here you go. Good morning, everybody. Since I have only 15 minutes, I'll just go right into it. Uh, you have the title, the subtitle is uh, I started an unwritten invisible contract with a mistaken people. Uh, the short answer is no, but uh, <laughs> if I stop here, <laughs> I'll say 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole point, rhetorically or otherwise, is to say a little bit more, and the trick is how to say yes and uh, how to qualify this yes and it's an extremely qualified uh, yes. so i'll just read a few paragraphs throw in a few quotes and since i'll be running out of time uh i'll just stop uh anytime uh, when, uh, i'm stopped <laughs> <laughs> boy i really terrorized you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm very terrorized. Uh, hopefully uh, by that time i'll Share with you some of the main arguments, the main solutions. <clears throat> okay, so let's start. No, because the answer is no, because there's no formal contract existing between the party and the people, the party and the state, or between the state and the people. So there's no explicit contract. In fact, one could say that the very notion and necessity of such contract contract is rejected by uh, and has no place in the Chinese political legal system. The Chinese state as a party state simply exists as a self-appointed representation in documents and self-expression of the general will, whom, uh, whose political homogeneity renders any social contract or positive legal codification redundant, sentimental, and mis misbehaved by, by the, uh, the state. This observation forms the empirical as well as ideological basis for Western media and legal political scholarship to define the Chinese state as authoritarian and the Chinese Communist Party as dictatorial, that is, from the liberal rule of law point of view and based on the technical definition of constitutional state as we know it, that is, as it's defined by the particular historical experience and legal juristic operation of Western bourgeoisie societies. Western bourgeois society. The yes answer, with the quotation mark, yes answer would be far less straightforward or transparent. The argument would be strenuous and at the point tortuous to an extreme degree, but this is the answer the most interesting. To make such speculation possible, let alone productive, one needs to take a different theoretical and, his, and a historical frame that is simultaneously more sympathetic and more critical. I take my cue from Carl Schmidt when he argues in constitutional theory, published in 1928, quite convincingly, I think, that a real constitution must already propose an existing political unity and the consciousness of a people who acts as a concrete, the present constitution making power that in turn decides on the nature of this people as a political being, as a historical subject, equivalent to Western bourgeoisie or middle class as an ongoing historical phenomenon, and given this imagined equivalent late arrival on the world historical stage, a different, that is more heightened and intensified, socio-economic, moral, political constitution 
necessary for collective self-preservation, choosing its quote-unquote path of development and a form of life. Uh, these two terms, the last two terms, path of development and a form of life, are often uh, used in non-Western societies when uh, there's a need to counter the moral political pressure uh, from the West in the name of the rule of law or constitutional state. And last but not least, for individual freedom and rights and protection uh, made possible uh, only within this collective framework and with significant qualifications vis-a-vis -vis the historical precedent or influence in the political pressure uh, often from Western In light of this argument, constitution in the sense of constitutional law is only the written affirmation and the confirmation of what is already in the making or what has been already constructed, rather than a doctrine or principle or a cluster of legal clauses on through and according to which a people as political being is to conduct its behavior under normal as, a, as opposed to abnormal or exceptional circumstances. The circumstances of modern China, like many fellow non-Western developing post-colonial or post-socialist nations, are anything but normal. Rather, one can argue that their economic, social, poli social political, and legal systems operate under perennial abnormal circumstances regarding to their domestic and international environment, to the point that the very survival of their state or state form is constantly a matter of strenuous effort and argument. In, a, in other words, it's always in a perennial state of crisis. This permanent state of exception, which calls for nearly constant intervention of extra legal power to sustain the state, necessarily renders the state pre-constitutional or unconstitutional. Although it is, as I will argue uh, in a moment, it's constitutionally in a different sense. I will argue that this nearly permanent pre-constitutional state of being, while messy and frustrating, uh, when viewed from a distance, say from the viewpoint of well-regulated normalcy of cons constitutional state of the new law, can also be examined more closely as a prolonged constitution making moment. In this light, an invisible unwritten contract can be discerned historically and conceptually within the very constitution making moment in which the Chinese people try to quote, give itself a constitution, unquote, again following Schmidt's verbal construction, by collectively siding with the Communist Party as opposed to the, the, its, its rival or uh, a competitor in the historical setting, in the same way as they just, uh, as they sided with the Nationalist Party as opposed to the Manchu monarchy of Qing Dynasty before. I'll skip the uh, uh, more detailed historical description or narrative of, uh, of this process, of prolonged processes of collective choice. And in official uh, 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 discourse of official though, it's often referred to as the Chinese people's choice. Uh, and uh, uh, with a sound of historical inevitability. But this, however uh, strenuously argued, I think stands as uh, a settled uh, 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 sort of a pattern of political distribution, a distribution of political power within the state, which according to Mao, who personally wrote and revised the Chinese constitution of 19. 53 to 57 uh, was very famously or infamously, depending where you stand, uh, that uh, observed that uh, the matter of state form, the polity, the body of the state, right, the constitution in the Chinese Congress, is not complex at all. Uh, Mao basically uh, scorned that the uh, bourgeois legalists for uh, laboring, slaving over these technical issues of constitution by observing that the matter of constitution is as simple as deciding on the distribution of ruling power among actually existing classes within the same social space. Once that's settled, you decide who is the ruling class, who is the root class, who is to rule, who is to be ruled, uh, inclu in inclusion, exclusion, when that pattern is set, there is a constitution, period. The, the nature of the Chinese state 
the state form is settled once and for all. The rest is for this constitution, although not necessarily in the Western the West, classical sense, is for this constitution to preserve itself. That's the constitution of self-consciousness, right? So with, if we keep that in mind, the, the, the question now I will come back to the, the, the matter of uh, contract. Uh, I think it's a good rhetorical uh, device to have this question in mind. Is there a contract? Is there an agreement? Uh, my over, overarching argument is this. Uh, there's no such contract explicitly. However, the Chinese state, the party state, the Communist Party as the sovereign, which oftentimes resorts to uh, extra legal uh, actions, feels the, the need to, from time to time, uh, uh, remind the, the people, the ruling, uh, so to speak, that it remembers the promise, the historical promise from that constitution making moment. You gave us the mandate of heaven. We are hired as the custodian of this mandate. You can take it back. But the fact that historically you decided to give it to me, I'm going to, to do my job. And it's my promise to you. And this promise acts as a reminder of an existing or non-existing contract, but within the constitutional framework. That's my uh, my argument. This promise, it, I think, is a very interesting way of simultaneously bypassing the concept of social contract, uh, and by extension, this notion, Western notion of rule of law and check and balance and so on and so forth. Because those devices, mechanisms, constitutional mechanisms, setups, will deprive the Communist Party of this the final decisive extra legal intervention, which it considers extremely necessary given all the uh, concrete political circumstances, uh, subversion, you know, uh, civil war, all kinds of uh, uh, political pressure and, uh, and, 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 and difficulties. And in terms, again, in terms of that uh, existing and yet non-existing contract, uh, in the form of a promise, goes something like this. Uh, it's such a tricky rule of construction, I have to read it because uh, I sometimes uh, confuse myself. It's, it's something like uh, in terms of this promise uh, uh, a promise to deliver the promise, but without the promise, not to break the promise when the possibility of de delivering the promise is at risk. As breaking the promise is part of the promise, or what is necessary to keep the promise. So in order for me to deliver what I've promised you, what you have hired me to do, I have to reserve the right to break the promise. I can, you cannot subject me to those Western notions of the law, constitutional state, because then my, my hands will be tied I won't be able to deliver what I promised you effectively. And that the substantive content of that the promise includes, as we all know, economic development, especially now, this economic growth, that's part of the promise. The improvement of, uh, uh, of uh, quality of life across the board, education, infrastructure, Medicare, insurance, pension, retirement, in terms of those actual concrete developments, uh, what's going on in China is phenomenal, it's epic, unprecedented in world historical, uh, 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 on world's uh, historical history. Um, I want to make uh, 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 one last point, I guess about two minutes. Good. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a moment in the, that constitutional, constitutional making moment there's a uh, uh, two crucial moments we'll have to keep in mind. One is this moment of galvanization, this moment when everything is seen. This is greatly aided by the, the new culture movement, the revolution, the unification of spoken language, 
which is at the core of the so-called Chinese Enlightenment, in which nominally the elite and the mass population become one because of the unification of spoken written language. Uh, and that the, like, the latter stage development of that Chinese Enlightenment takes the form of the Chinese Communist Party's re rectification movement. The internal self education, self cultivation, and in which Mao uh, famously uh, uh, formulates his philosophy of education. In other words, the educator needs to be educated by the, by the masses to be educated. Because you are supposed to, the intellectuals equipped with Western ideas, Rousseau and Mao uh, and all that, will have to be extremely self conscious about. Uh, acting on behalf of the ignorant, illiterate peasantry, or farmers, or workers, the soldiers, who they themselves cannot engage in this legal, political, intellectual, cultural fight. So therefore, it's very important for the educator, those who engage in raising the standard, to keep in mind the standard itself is the people's standard, not your standard, not landlord's standard. Not the urban bourgeoisie standard, but the, the masses standard, the people's standard. So that gives you an indication of this moment when everything is sealed into a, an actual homogeneity, uh, which gives rise to this actually existing unity, power, self consciousness. You can argue that that was like 50 years ago or 75 years ago, but the, the fact that this promise is uh, uh, evoked once in a while. Uh, I think it's a, uh, in the absence of a formal social contract, that's something that could stand for this memory, this consciousness of this constitution world, now prolonged, even perpetualized in this particular world. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, burdens that I may spare wings and mount the air, I now am ready uh, to assume my former responsibilities and quit this heritage. Warm but also calculated evocations of return, of brotherly union, uh, brotherly communion, of fealty to the sovereign person abound in Talgis' uh, poetic corpus. As an example, we discover the so called symposium verses, uh, where the lyrical voice bestows a benediction upon those sitting around a banquet for long lasting health and uh, many future occasions of such gatherings. Uh, still another, the Dorito may be located later, a beautifully composed memorials uh, that is after the throne had been passed from his elder brother to his nephew, uh, with the author, as will be explained, be begs with sad comedy uh, uh, to be considered for the court's major political and military uh, uh, missions. And for a larger perspective, uh, uh, the potency of metaphors uh, of the political, of the togetherness, not so much poised against an outside as defined uh, by the dynamic uh, of central unison uh, and collective mandate, uh, can never be underestimated as an essential literary making device in China since Confucianism uh, became canon. Um, on the one hand, just to take uh, uh, Shizin, the Book of Odes, as example, works grouped under the appellation of social <coughs> eulogies, which uh, uh, by and large charge of the function to um, uh, renew this with core and ground of trust and support for the often a stately occasion being initiated that is performatively uh, brought into uh, factuality by these pieces. On the other hand, uh, Chuan, who lived about six centuries prior to South, but was adopted by Confucians as the first individuated poet of great moral consequence, may be seen as having pioneered a form in which the political satisfaction described by the ancient eulogies anticipates its necessary uh, uh, supplement, uh, and all, uh, in which uh, Tao Shu also amply uh, uh, took. A separation from the political unity, uh, from the political community, uh, as often embodied in an idealized monarch, uh, and from uh, the position of power and influence, is here con conveyed uh, in terms of pain and disappointment. For modern politicized conceptions of human affinity, we are no doubt indebted to a harsh fit. If the Heideggerian being with describes a moment of existential forgiveness in constitutional theory and other places, Schmidt made it very clear that politics comes to life only when social relations remain uh, intense and, of course, intensely uh, partial. Uh, both uh, trusts in the universal good and refuses to make either or uh, choices in parliamentary negotiations, for instance, for, for instance refer to an evasion of the uh, political. Uh, but more to, to, to Heidegger, uh, especially in reference to Dasein's access to his own homeless uh, with ex via ecstasy, uh, uh, being politically partial is categorically not the outcome, outcome of uh, a, a, a recent process. Even though within a well-formed political system, the jostling of reason uh, may rule to an extent, the achievement of political unity in the originary and fundamental sense cannot be subject to theoretical justification. A political, uh, a political decision is made of when certain topics, issues, and problematics are resolutely barred from social representation. What stands out as something of a paradox in uh, this line of thinking, however, is that whereas the political act of constitutional decision must be so enshrined as not to be susceptible to trivial revisionist contingencies, the act is also one that cannot be concluded once and for all. Schmidt, in the end, is not informed with the, uh, the, the eschatology of the Heideggerian kind. Instead, as he stipulates in the third meaning of constitution in absolute sense, uh, the, the partial unity, that is the form of, and condition of the social and the political togetherness uh, now chosen to be pursued, is a matter of dynamic emergence and renewed, info, uh, renewed formation. I quote, the state is understood not as something existing, resting uh, statically, but as something uh, uh, emerging, as something always arising. A new end quote. It is palm openings as such that recent theorists, in the like of Chantal Mouffe, uh, seek, uh, seek to, to map out possibilities of reconciliation between the Habermasian uh, deliberativist, de de deliberativist uh, critique and, and Schmidt's radical uh, decision, uh, decisionist insistence. Uh, my reading of Tauch also takes uh, its departure from the prospect of co constituting the, the dynamic, emerging, the, the new, and the renewed. 
uh, but particularly in light of the Lacanian uh, Rio as, an phenomenon, as a phenomenon of the neither nor, uh, as opposed to uh, the, the, the Schmittian uh, uh, either or. In uh, 225, uh, our author, a prince of, of the Wei, uh, a mighty Chinese state that held in its domain uh, much of the modern countries, northern and central territories, uh, issued a decree to subjects of his fiefdom, uh, in which he opined on the nature of government. The quote, let the types of the state servants be told. <coughs> there is one responsive to teachings of the sages, and another who, uh, who answers to the spur of bequests and, uh, and allowances. Whereas uh, these, uh, whence these two uh, uh, incentives prove not suffice in guiding behaviors, corporal punishment uh, and uh, material deprivation must we adopt in motivating capacity. And he who the latter fails to bring on the right path is cut out of a wise master's services." End quote. To suggest that by year six of an unforgiving brother's reign, uh, the one-time imperial hopeful, and according to a uh, later estimate, um, the greatest Chinese poet prior to the middle, eight, mid middle centuries still refused to see his expectations as terminally dashed. I mean, as for a stretch in documentary as well as interview uh, uh, verification. Uh, but next to such colossal defeat, nursed under unrelenting family suspicion and uh, uh, institutionalized torment, his insight regarding the mundane nature of political operations seemed to take on trans-historical uh, trans validity because of a strange barbarian uh, a harshness poignantly uh, rendered. Uh, for, uh, for instance, it, uh, also in the 1918 lecture, uh, Politics as a Vocation, I quote, the administrative staff, which externally represents the uh, organization of, uh, of, of political domination, is, of course, like any other organization, bound by obedience to a power holder and not alone by the concept of legitimacy. Uh, there are two other means, both of which appeal to personal interests, material reward, and social honor, end quote. For Tsaoja as well, as, as much as for uh, Weber, uh, politics is a Janus face business. Uh, to the extent that it exacts a grueling rationality in outer expressions, it demands, at the same time, an inner satisfaction, an ethical answerability to transcend the mere logic of horse trading and the rolling of pork barrows. Uh, that is, of obedience and service to, uh, in exchange for clout and in, 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 in enjoyment, uh, employment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, a, a closer meeting, I mean, that's, uh, uh, a closer meeting, I mean, that suggests that the decree speaks for, uh, not only harshly to his retainers, etc., but also bitterly to himself and those implicit addresses as a note on a submission and a self-organization that is some antiquarian form of the uh, the uh, the uh, 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 he was uh, here at elsewhere since his 20, late 20s to, uh, to tender the image of a former rival, having now thoroughly absorbed the lessons by sages and cognizant of his uh, rival, sorry, thank you, uh, rightful place, uh, a, a conquered foe in, in, in tearing uh, gratitude uh, to the largest the victor and a prodigal sibling uh, brought under the pain of punishment and deprivation to senses. Indeed, the irony of Tsaoju's political endeavor was that his literary communications were typically two-toned. He could harbor every intention to discourse in deference to uh, propriety, and yet his was a persistent position, categorically unamendable uh, by uh, sagely teachings, uh, and indifferent not only to worldly inducement, but also to the pain of punishment deprivation. Uh, the 225 um, uh, po uh, the, the decree postulates essential conditions uh, for what Weber deems political domination. It's apparent, fo apparent focus on, po po on the pi a power dialogue between the dominant and dom dominated does not so much conceal as highlight a piece of anxiety, uh, provoking a reality that is a one-time closed contender for the throne, Cao Zhu, in his present exclusion from the category of the politically dominant, uh, might find no secure home in that of the dominated. Contemporaneous uncertainty surrounding uh, such a person, uh, such an individual apparently concerned less with whether he could be exploited for the potential service of the master than uh, whether he would exploit others 
for potential service to himself as master, or if at all, certain disloyal servants would exploit him for potential as master. Uh, the odd topology of his embroidered position was such that he was at once not in typical relationship uh, of the dominant and dominated, and not, not in such a relationship. He's separate, but still together. In terms of the uh, decrees, set the speculation on political usefulness, there's no denying that uh, despite his uh, apparent toss into official disuse, he remains marginally, strangely useful for the core's political purpose. Um, and the primary so uh, the source of agitation that troubled to trouble his existence was thus not that he was victim to suspicion and preemptive pre discipline, but that he had to be, so to speak, uh, uh, repeatedly used in his apparent disuse. It is course his articulations assumed uh, political a specific difference regardless of the fact that they were uh, 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 they were manifestly emptied of such significance, uh, that is, of imperial and master intentions, fantasies, reminiscences. His political fear and poetic glory may both be rooted then in a fact that when his dialogue, when his, his language was at a pace, uh, he by default did not have control over its temporal and terminal uh, signification. On this grave occasion where we, uh, we, we uh, ponder the ramifications of the constitution, constitutional theories, I would also conjure um, the lively but somewhat irreverent voice of Slavoj Zizek, uh, which I believe is familiar uh, uh, on, this, on this campus. In his reading of popular narratives, Zizek divides uh, detective stories into Sherlock Holmes type and Philip, uh, Philip Marlowe type. In a former uh, de de detective, not only solves the case because he knows exactly what, hap what has happened, but also takes a payment for his rendition of services. In the letter, he who solves the case does not know uh, the missing parts uh, of a crime narrative down to every uh, uh, detail, but more importantly, does not take uh, it does not get reimbursed for all the trouble he takes because he is too much involved. He literally owns his case. For the Khan and Zizek, payment of fees is never a small matter in such scenarios, since its occurrence or no tells us whether the protagonist is merely working with what may be rationally uh, presented in the oppositional symbolic terms, that is, crime versus justice, puzzle versus solution, uh, service versus evaluation, etc., or with something that disrupts that, uh, uh, such terms and renders them at least temporarily powerless. Therefore, in a typical story, Holmes walks away uh, after collecting his fees, the fees being at the same time a token of non-relationship. As a contrast, Malu never is able, uh, never is quite able to extract himself from the life world into which he once delves. The, uh, the, the, the absence of fees uh, indicates unfinished business and unending involvement. In Lacanian uh, parlance, Holmes deals in the symbolic and Marlow the real. My reading of Salzer will then end on a comical note. There is a species of political life that simply cannot be categorized, categorized as uh, constitutional or treasonous, but alive, and agitating, unstoppable, and always a remainder of the constituted state. In much of the prince's life, he was not someone who owns class centers. He was not someone who owns the means of uh, politics in a barbarian sense, but he owns it. And maybe the best way to describe his mode of politics is that he owns it without means. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter, what is the second estate? Andrea Gadberry, also from New York University. Thanks. Um, um, in his famous What is the Third Estate, Casca de Tia of 1789, the ICS gives us his formulation for constituent power, which are familiar to many people in this room. Uh, it's the people who are the nation, and it is the nation which precedes the state. The people authorize and legitimize the exercise of constituent power in its various constituted forms. Thank you. Uh, in arriving at this conclusion, Siaz's logic topples the ancien regime with its system of three estates, the first, second, and third, split respectively into the clergy, the nobility, and everyone else. 
In this new secular state, the third estate, the people, have become, as he puts it, everything. There's a long afterlife in theory and in practice to these ideas, not to mention some very famous readers from Marx to Schmidt. In addition to extensive writing on the people and their constituent power, we all have seen accounts for what happens to the first estate, the clergy, and I'm thinking of political theological accounts, of course. But at the heart of um, my paper's speculations today is my sense that the second estate has gone overlooked and under-theorized, um, and that it instead is an open secret of at least some constitutions and of many cultural problems. And we've already seen one such moment where an aristocrat has appeared hiding in plain sight. I'm not adding anyone in this room, don't worry. <laughs> um, in yesterday's anecdote about Frederick the Great, the transformation of the, the sort of parable we heard from fiction to fact. So remember, there was Frederick uh, who dutifully respected the judiciary, and then we learn in the real version, he overrules it. Hidden in this transformation um, was something else and a different punchline. In the benevolent version, the count goes uncounted. So remember, there was this aristocratic character that we never uh, acknowledged. So when C.S. defines the second estate, he assumes a similarly effacing mode. The second estate, he will say, is nothing. It seems that the historical record tends to agree. So the privileges that once made for separate laws would be abolished. Historical titles would be stripped. The nobility would lose its former relevance in many regards. In the 15 minutes allotted to me today, however, I want to pose this question again. What is the second estate? Well, this is precisely the question that animates the invective of both what is the third estate and his earlier essay on privileges from 1788. It's a hard task to define nothing. Um, given that the third estate announces itself as everything in contrast to this nothing, ex nihilo perhaps, it seems useful to return to the moment before we learn or remember that the people are everything. So in two examples in which Siaz finds himself trying to define or find a language for this nothing, an intractable problem will emerge. If the second estate is nothing, in its elaborations it must be uh, represented uh, in the face of the contention that it is not and never has really been. This is on the one hand a literary problem that complicates moments of rhetorical demolition, but it's also a problem for constitu constitutional theory and theory writ large, especially for understanding what the extended version of this conference's call for papers means, the lost hope that emancipation from tyranny would have naturally led in a particular political direction. So I hope to point to some of the unnatural directions history has left us to consider in tracing the persistence of aristocratic form. In Siaz's essay on privileges, the difficulty of talking about an aristocracy that is nothing manifests in the form of a joke about a dictionary that both demonstrates the danger of the language of the aristocracy, uh, the, the language that they speak, but also diminishes its power. In a lengthy footnote, Siaz lampoons the linguistic habits of the elite, all while winking at contemporary theories of language. And he writes, I give up understanding all the nuances, all the fine points of the customary language of the privileged. For that language, we need a specialized dictionary, which would be novel, because instead of presenting the proper or metaphorical senses of words, it would, on the contrary, be a matter of removing the true meaning of the words to leave nothing beneath other than a void of reason. The footnote makes many straightforward jabs at the aristocratic norms including the absurdity of petty infights among the different ranks within the second estate. But as the footnote continues, C.S. tells us the dictionary reveals that noble titles belong only to people from a mythical nowhere. We would learn from this new dictionary, he writes, that there is only birth, naissance, for those who have no point of origin. The dictionary does double duty. It imagines a kind of language of empty signification, but it also demystifies the noble claim to superior birth. Instead of ancestry or legend, the operative term is nothing, no origin. Better yet, there's no language left with which to spread aristocratic propaganda or even gossip. In revealing a lexicon of nothing but noise, the fantasy of an aristocratic dictionary, a dictionary of the void, C.S. does more than house his trademark vituperation. He also gives us a containment strategy that hollows out what it contains, a magic book that blurs the line between joke and spell that makes a container for nothing. The following year, C.S. returns to the, the rhetorical contest between nothing and everything in what is the third estate. There, the leveling dictionary gives way to a series of metaphors that represent nothing by staging a failed sequence of comparisons. 
So the essay famously ends with Siaz claiming that the second estate must be neutralized, just as his imagined dictionary did with her aristocratic speech. In a series of hyperbolic characterizations, the second estate stops producing speech as it did before, and instead accrues descriptions that make it oddly difficult to pinpoint just what this nothing is. So we learn, for instance, that the aristocracy cannot, quote, exist by itself since it has no functioning organs, attaches itself to a real nation like one of those parasitic forms of vegetation that live off the sap of the plants that they exhaust and desiccate, end quote. Alternate, alternately, they are, quote, a pestilence upon the nation that is forced to suffer its existence. To make the comparison more exact, exact this is still CS, um, one would have to compare a privileged class in a nation to a frightful disease devouring the living flesh of the body of its unhappy victim. And likewise, um, to ask what place the privilege ought to hold would be, quote, to ask what place we would want to assign a bad humor that undermines and torments the body. So to be sure, all three of these descriptions cultivate the disgust they're designed to provoke. In each instance, the second estate brings sickness and suffering. Yet in contrast to the celebrated lines of Siaz's pamphlet, where the third estate is everything to the second estate's nothing, here the nobility's nothing is wildly shape-shifting. The parasite, the flesh-eating disease, and the more nebulous bad humor. But as with the dream of the dictionary, there's a problem of definition. The comparison isn't exact enough. Even after Siaz claims that a frightful disease devouring the flesh uh, would improve the comparison, he finds himself scrambling for another set of terms. These shifting comparisons point to the problem of talking from or about nothing. Such incommensurability makes comparison itself impossible and produces multiplication instead. More words without meaning, more types of illness, and no real cure. Here, the second estate's new status as nothing sits alongside these multiplying effects to produce representations without anything underneath, underneath it to be represented. On the road to making the case for the constituent power of the people, then, CS has to neutralize the second estate, that nation within a nation that claims to have a special purchase on the social and political order. In what I've outlined above, one route to this neutralization moves from dictionary to disease. In the case of the imagined dictionary, Siaz relies on the self-evidence of aristocratic absurdity and language is power to yield to powerless and emptiness and mere sound. In such meaninglessness, the dictionary promises to be unusable, reducing its language to senseless murmur, and it also neatly wraps up aristocratic discourse in a book that can be closed. As Siaz moves from dictionary to disease, eradication depends on the health of the body politic, but just what the second estate is is still harder to diagnose. Read together, these episodes seem to suggest that even if there is no place to assign a bad humor in a body, rendering it neutral isn't necessarily rendering it null. There may be no real meaning of aristocratic language to be communicated, and it may be impossible to diagnose or even describe the blight the nobility creates, but this nothing certainly seems to exceed the category to which it has been assigned. In these texts, which ultimately did help produce real revolution, that preceded real constitutions, and that have shaped conversations about peoples and states for centuries to follow, these rhetorical schemes for turning something into nothing, or nothing into something, take the formula for aristocratic supremacy and reveal its hollowness. There's nothing here but secondary fictions, stylized speech gathered into meaningless, meaninglessness, or accretions of comparisons that eliminate the possibility of diagnosis. Or Siaz himself less interested in more conservative roots, as in his uh, ambivalent support for constitutional monarchy, for instance, it might be possible to imagine him developing further the linguistic project he begins with his dictionary of the void and continues in the mutually canceling comparisons that stymie his diagnosis. He is, after all, on the verge of providing such a formula, one that would exorcise the second estate, and that already sounds conveniently like an 18th century slogan, too. No representation without presentation. That is, it seems like however much nothing can reveal, be revealed to have been everything all along, and this is the formula of the third estate coming out of nothing and uh, self-authorizing, another kind of nothing can also dangerously reproduce meaninglessness or undiagnosable representations. Um, so that was the literary part, and I'm moving to that speculative section. So for much of the 18th century, fighting about just what the second estate was made more sense than defining the third, making Siaz's reversal all the more astonishing. As Sarah Maza puts it, quote, until the eve of the revolution, when the third estate became an intense focus of debate, nobody much cared about the identities, rights, and responsibilities of rich or middling commoners. 
If anyone did, that concern was drowned out by the much louder and more intense debates about the nobility. What people argued about in the Age of Enlightenment was not the possible emergence of a new elite, but the origins, nature, role, and future of France's ancient aristocracy. In spite of the survival of at least nostalgia, if not a new elite, theories of the leisure class would come to be framed as cultural problems more than constitutional ones. Yet when C.S. appears in Carl Schmitt's 1928 constitutional theory, it is unsurprisingly in a discussion of aristocracy and representation. Um, though there the path I have traced from dictionary to disease, or we might say from the juridical to the biopolitical, is less evident. The idea of representation, Schmidt writes, was displaced by the principle of direct identity, which immediately made the great mass of people appear as something entirely self-evident. But in terms of this is Schmidt, but in terms of understanding parliamentarianism and bourgeois representative constitution, it is necessary to remind oneself that their fundamental character is aristocratic. In Schmidt's formulation, the aristocracy maintains a special hold on representation. But instead of nothing in relation to the great mass of people's everything, it becomes merely a form in relationship to the more concrete stuff of identity. The political form of aristocracy, he continues, rests on the idea of representation. In a system with such a representational form, not a single person, but rather a majority of person represents the political entity. Thus, there is in aristocracy itself a certain moderation. In Schmidt's appeal to moderation lie the echoes of ancient arguments about mixed form, as well as 18th century arguments about the moderating effects of appeasing the aristocracy, as if they were a middle point in a fundamental antagonism between a king, a president, and the people. Consider, for instance, Montesquieu's claim that the, mu the mere common freedom would be disastrous for men of distinction. In Schmidt's reading, Siez's wish to neutralize the aristocracy seems to have worked, but in a noxious way that leaves aristocratic form very much alive. A neutralizing check on other modes of excess, represented in form, but not present in persons. Still nothing enough. In setting up the second estate as nothing, and making it the nothing against which the people emerge, and showing how it appears in language as representations without presentation, Siaz, it seems to me, has still more to contribute to theory than the ample amount he already has. In what is the third estate, Siaz himself would suggest that to understand what was happening, a new kind of knowledge would have to be located. In what was the first recorded use of the term, he named that approach a science sociale, a social science. If perhaps the social science he had in mind might not yet have arrived, I think at a minimum we can still return to the questions about nothing Siaz's Ciaz, text implicitly poses. Is the second estate, as it seems to be in the text I've discussed today, an unnoticed kind of constitutive exclusion from the top, distinct from the exclusions of so many hominid sacri on the one hand, or from the exceptions of the sovereign on the other? Is it, as a sociologist and aristocrat, Gabriel Tarek wrote, quote, the unconscious mother of modern times? At the very least, the question seems to ask us to return to the grammar of constitutions, to ask how the second estate may have shaped how we talk about the people, particularly when, as Agamemnon writes in a fleeting reference to the nobility, we talk about the people in reference to the nothing of the aristocracy. He writes, in common speech as in political parlance, the term people still conserves the sense of ordinary people in contrast to the rich and the nobility. As if recognizing the impenetrability of the problem, Siaz himself will note that even though the second estate is nothing, it seems like it hasn't stopped and will not stop producing speech. I am amazed, I admit, he writes, by the talent with which the privileged extend these sublime, although unceasing, conversations as far as the eye can see, without ever losing themselves. My speculation today has been that this conversation, however diminished or transformed, might not have stopped, and that its murmur may have continued beneath or alongside so many constitutions, indifferent to the fall of despots, and often just out of view of the eye of theory, impervious to the question posed directly to it, what is the second estate? and scarcely withholding its contempt for the urgent follow-up, what is to be done. Thanks. Our final presenter this morning will be Craig Lush from the University of Oregon. How Australia, from practice to theory, how Australian liberal democracy has been transformed 
not necessarily with that. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at a function, uh, I was having a discussion with a senator and also a minister of the Crown, Australian government, and she asked me what I was working on. I said, oh, I'm working on the nexus. Uh, she looked at me rather puzzled. Um, and I said, oh, that's section 24, which says basically that the size of the Senate has to be half the size of the House of Representatives. Uh, and I was wondering, still didn't know what I was talking about, and I was just to start with this, uh, how many politicians actually know what's in the Constitution of the uh, UK? <laughs> they certainly know the rules in Parliament, so right. how much they know. And uh, section 24, in fact, was a constitutional clause without any precedent. Uh, it was designed to do two things, protect the interests, what will become the smaller states, and prevent the growth of the House of Representatives, and actually, in the latter days, it succeeded admirably. Um, then also indicates something about the cultural presuppositions for those who wrote the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. The Constitution itself was the outcome of a number of constitutional conventions involving representatives of various colonies from 1891 to 1898. It was then put to the people of the colony, each colony for approval, took two goes. Uh, then interestingly enough, it was passed by the British Parliament. So how do we understand what the Australian Constitution was about in the 1890s? I think there are three things involved. In terms of political culture, the document was drawn up by people trained in English common law who believed the model of political perfection was the British Constitution. They wanted a constitution which could grow and evolve as the British Constitution did. To get the constitution meant being pragmatic about what was going to be achieved. Uh, and one of the major issues here, getting back to the nexus, was the issue of the large and small colonies and how to, to, um, to balance the two. And in my view, actually, I think they gave away too much to the small colonies. States. And the goal was the achievement of the federation of the colonies. The constitution is a federal constitution. It is not a constitution about defining the values of the Australian people. Uh, and for example, it has no bill of rights, has very little, it has trial by jury, but has very little, and the Commonwealth has to pay you if it takes away your land, but there's not an awful lot about rights. Even the preamble caused considerable discussion. Um, and the preamble states, where is the people of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland, and Tasmania, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, have agreed to be united in one indissoluble federal commonwealth under the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and under the constitution uh, hereby established. The inclusion of Almighty God caused considerable conflict. Um, interestingly enough, opposition to it was led by the Seventh Day Adventists, uh, who feared that it would lead to the imposition of sectarianism. Uh, pretty curious. And this led to Section 116, which basically says the Commonwealth did not make any law for establishing religion. So you got God in one way, but you got the separate in the other. This was a constitution drawn up by an overseas British community. It is a fairly bare bones and utilitarian. But then that's what one would expect of an overseas British community. It was a device to secure the goal of a federated Australia. The Commonwealth has sometimes been termed the Westminster system, in that it brought together the Westminster system, responsible government, and American federalism. Uh, they certainly didn't want Canada for their federalism. <laughs> uh, they wanted American, they thought it was better. There was no desire to define how the Westminster system worked in the Constitution. People of British origin, trained in English law, simply knew how it worked, and they had 40 years' experience. It was part of their cultural heritage. So, I'll come back to that and see if it's that in a moment. Naturally, the Constitution evolved over the past 100 years. The power of the Commonwealth government has grown, and its range of responsibilities has increased. This is not this has not occurred because of the formal alteration of the constitution. The constitution is notoriously difficult to change because you it's done by referendum and you need what's called a double um, majority. That means you need an overall majority and a majority and a majority of states. And instead of six states, you need four out of six states and an overall majority. Very difficult. <coughs> uh, they didn't realise that at the time. 
Change has occurred because of judicial review, which has worked in favour of the growth of Commonwealth powers. This is largely because of the doctrine of realism, or interpreting the words as they are written on the paper. So the scriptural interpretation of the legal meaning of the words. And this is allowed, because what the Constitution probably didn't realise, this allowed the more power to have the Commonwealth. The increasing power of the Commonwealth government has not received much in resistance. I don't think Australians actually believe in federalism, even though they used it to come together. It was a device to create a national government. It was an artificial means for replicating the British Constitution. The Westminster section part of the Constitution is not written down and depends on what are called conventions. This works fine, I think, or worked fine, so long as there was a consensus regarding those conventions and how they work. This was the case for the next 25 years. Having a changed federation, Australian politics worked as if it was simply another variety of British politics. Well into the 1950s, Australians thought themselves as being British, and this included politicians who considered Irish ancestry. For example, Australian women had made sacrifices after 1945, so it was sent through to Britain. The world changed about 1960. The British Empire was no more. Australia was ceasing to be a British country, including in population terms. Over time, what had once been taken for granted was becoming less self-evident. And this change can be seen in terms of the 1975 constitutional crisis, which you've probably not heard of, but basically it was that the Senate refused supply, refused to pass money bills, uh, there was a deadlock between the two houses of Parliament, and the Governor-General intervened, dismissed the Prime Minister, uh, put in the Leader of Opposition on condition that he hold this double dissolution collection. Uh, now, there's two elements of the Westminster system which were breached. The first is the Governor-General is the monarch's representative, acts on advice of the Prime Minister. Well, obviously, in dismissing the Prime Minister, the Governor-General was not acting on the advice. Uh, the second one is that the other House, the Senate, is essentially a house of review and cannot reject money bills. Unfortunately, the Commonwealth Constitution clearly states uh, that the Senate may not amend proposed laws opposing taxation or propose laws appropriating revenues or monies for the ordinary annual services of the government. The Senate may not amend any proposed bill as to increase the um, proposed change or burden on the people. But apart from that, except as provided in this section, the Senate shall have equal power with the House of Representatives in respect of all proposed laws. Basically, very powerful upper house, uh, potentially. So it cannot amend money bills, but it can reject money bills. That's, that's the crucial point there. Um, equally, it nowhere states in the Constitution that the Governor General has to take the advice of the Prime Minister. That's not mentioned either. So in 1975, as I said, the Governor General dismissed the Prime Minister and appointed the leader of the opposition, Mr. Fraser, on a condition he called an election. I think that this event, which caused a lot of anguish at the time, indicated that the illusion that Australian politics was simply just another version of British politics was shattered. I think there's a number of implications which have played out over time over this. The first is that the Senate has discovered just how much power it has. It is not a mere house of review. It has developed a robust committee system, and owing to the fact that it's elected by proportional representation, is now home to many minor parties. The government of the day has problems getting things through the Senate. Only once uh, in recent times, 2004 to 2007, did the government have a majority in the Senate. The Senate is invariably not under its control. Uh, and for the current government since 2013, has had enormous problems getting its legislation passed or doing things to reject, to, to, uh, to reduce the deficit and cut spending. Uh, the Senate is a, a it's someone you can blame when you can't get things done. But <laughs> it, it, the, the point being, of course, is that it's become much more aware of the power that it has. Uh, even though originally, um, for the first 75 years, it didn't seem to have that power. It seemed to be much more of a house of view. I think the Constitution of then has also become more important as a document which affects the workings of Australian politics. But it's not the Constitution that was understood in the 1890s, drawn up as the expression of British uh, political community. Very few people read the debates of the 1890s conventions. Uh, I've read some of them, I've read them all. 
No one is interested in the original intentions of the people who grew up the Constitution. Uh, perhaps this is for good reason, as some of the assumptions, uh, for example, behind the nexus, have proved to be wrong. What we are left with are the words on the page which are interpreted in a fashion. The Constitution, and because the Constitution is so difficult to change, um, it's basically in that form. There's very little governments now, as I said, judicial, judicial um, interpretation is the major way in which it gives you change. Okay. I think this reveals some interesting issues relating to the relationship between um, Constitution and Australian politics. This is illustrated by the recent ruckus caused by Section 44 of the Constitution. Uh, Section 44 is a disqualification of people set in the, in the bound. And the, the, it's got a number of them. The is, and anyone, any person who is under any acknowledgement of allegiance, obedience, or adherence to a foreign power, or is a subject, or a citizen, or entitled to the rights or privileges of a subject or, or a citizen of a foreign power is disqualified. Uh, now, in 1901, there's no such thing as a straight citizen. In fact, this is the only course the Constitution has to put a citizen in it. There were only British subjects. Australian citizenship <coughs> dates from 1948. Um, and the big issue since has become, obviously, that dual citizenship. And the Heather Hill case in 1999, it was an early one as well, ruled that Senator Hill was not eligible to sit in as a senator, as she still had British citizenship, it was a split high court decision. So one of the obvious things to do with that, which you'll find very, probably most people find bizarre, is that the Queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is a distinct entity to the Queen of Australia, is a distinct entity to the Queen of Canada, is a distinct entity to the Queen where they are. So in recent cases, the High Court has ruled that members need to have renounced or taken reasonable steps to renounce any dual citizenship they may hold. Now, this can be a very difficult process. Um, there was an Iranian member of the Senate who apparently had to pay $25,000 to the Iranian government to have his citizenship announced. Um, but many politicians have been called, including one such as the Deputy Prime Minister, Barney Joyce, whose father was born in New Zealand, came to Australia when he was young, before 1948, before there was even Australian citizenship. He had to resign, renounce his New Zealand citizenship, and then recontest his House of Representatives seat, which he won. Um, so there have been many cases of individuals who have renounced their dual nationality in the Parliament, only to take it up once their parliamentary career is over. There's a truly bizarre spectacle being played out. Part of the cause is the very literal interpretation by the High Court of the Constitution. Political parties have been paying tit for tat regarding the citizenship status of their opponents. So each side of politics is trying to catch out members of the other side. Ah, you've actually got a British grandmother or a Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll just conclude by saying the current state of Australian politics and the working political system, by no means in the 1890s, was then assumed that Australia would continue to be an overseas British community for a long time. The Constitution reflects that fact. But a kind of Britishness has had considerable implications, many of which may have been not have been fully appreciated. The old politics of the first 60 and 70 years of the Commonwealth have been replaced only by a different type of politics, which are far more confrontational and also rationalistic, as implied understandings have been superseded by the use of the Constitution as a document which can be used for political purposes. Part of this also relates to the replacement of the old Parliament House, which was very intimate, by the much colder act how this will eventually play out is uncertain. It is difficult, for example, to make reasonable change to the Constitution. And the Nexus is a clear example of this because of the size of the Senate has to be increased in proportion to the size of the House of Representatives. If we were, at the moment, for example, Tasmania has um, five members of the lower house and 12 senators. Uh, so, if we increase the size of the parliament, Tasmania would still have five members of the lower house and perhaps have 14 or 16 senators, which is very odd anyway. Um, so, despite some claims, um, it's very <coughs> easy to see how the constitution, which started as a very bare bones, has, can be actually become an actual symbol of national unity. Uh, one senses at times a bit of a void, perhaps, at the heart of Australian political life. 
So thank you very much for that. I found Andrea's uh, paper fascinating in uh, pointing out this sort of a formal residual uh, sort of uh, place or placeholder that uh, used to be occupied by a, a, a aristocracy, uh, which is still structurally there only to be filled by something popular or mass in nature. Nevertheless, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting uh, reminder for us to continue to think through these issues, such as identity, uh, representation, uh, but in the context of culture, tradition, um, honor, you know, the sort of uh, self-sacrifice, you know, all these emotional and symbolic connections to something nebulous, but nevertheless actually existing. That, that, uh, I really appreciate the way you sort of piece those things out. I thought it was very thought-provoking. This is also just a comment, but one thing that struck me across the papers is that um, it seems like there was a preoccupation with what, how language works. So I'm thinking about, I wanted to hear more about um, about the structure of the promise, and then about uh, the consolidation of vernacular the language. And I was just so struck think, in your paper about um, that renunciation is not strictly verbal, that it, like it's an, a renunciation itself is an economic transaction, which um, for anyone who's uh, like gone through any government process here, like it costs money to become a citizen or to immigrate or get adjusted to status, so that's, that's familiar, but I think you, um, like there's something I thought very intriguing about um, a verbal act that requires money with it. And I'm also thinking about language in your talk, of course, and um, all the concepts of not firms. Uh, the aristocracy. In the Anglo American part, certainly in American strata, uh, there's a notion of a natural aristocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, because formal aristocracy is the issue. That's what we're going to get rid of, being formal, being privileged. But nevertheless, in any community, there are those who, by virtue of their virtues, talents, capacities, rise to the top. And that's often the I think, of representative government that the ordinary population should elect those who are natural out. In the, the passage that I alluded to from Montesquieu, he'll go on to say that um, like, there will always be people, men of honor, who distinguish themselves. And they'll they will struggle under common freedom. So that, like the flip side of that is this idea that there there are people who require <coughs> a special freedom. <coughs> I think that in that way it's not sort of monstrous. Well, it strikes me as um, something that is very um, like intriguing is is that um, is that um, sort of the aristocracy is also uh, um, is a, a uh, pre constitutional. Uh, form of government, uh, but at the same time, it's not without limits, right? Mm -hmm. um, the aristocrats are probably the most uh, sort of decorum savvy people. They know how to tell lines, right? It's all about form. It's all about limits, right? So in some ways, um, uh, yeah, without um, constitution, somehow this already there is a constitution. But then, what's tricky is that aristocracy when you put, doesn't sit well with with a modern state, it's always something that's, there's something subversive, right? Um, as we consider the, the emergence of the absolute states, and, and Weber talks about the expropriation, right? So that the, the absolute states, um, that the absolute monarch expropriates this political rights, the means of politics from the, the, from the aristocrats, from the feudal lords, and in the end, the modern democracy is the expropriation of the expropriator somehow. You know, that, that is the, the, it's always that's the, the, the Hegelian sort of process. But, um, so, 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 the aristocracy is really, in, in human history, is a really very, 
it's sort of interesting thing for me. I mean, it's, it, yes, it's constituted. Yes, it, it's sort of a it's a precursor. It, it's a placeholder uh, for for something that's more modern. But also, uh, it, it doesn't work well with the modern. It's always uh, there is. I think from a modern perspective, there is always something deeply treasonous because they do not. They are not totally vested in this thing. They are, they, are, they are all about their own deal, right? <laughs> There's things that feel slippery. But in this regard, I think that the, the, the Chinese tradition may offer us something uh, quite uh, uh, interesting, but also puzzling. This notion of a mandate of heaven means uh, the actual power comes and goes, but this is culture, a civilization, all under heaven that stays up beyond politics, even beyond the state, right? That's one thing. The other is this in the modern substitution of this uh, aristocracy. I was wondering whether <coughs> the vanguard party, this Leninist notion of a vanguard organization of the proletariat, is one possible candidate. Because if you look at the, the you know the the positive qualification of, of an ideal communist party, right, in terms of virtue, in terms of responsibility, self-sacrifice, every and so on, you are. It often puzzles my uh, colleagues working on Soviet, Russian mm -hmm. Soviet cultures. They say, hey, your description of a good communist uh, uh, a leader sounds like a good Confucian fellow to me. Whereas the Soviet new man is rational, universal, messianic, you know, with all these uh, a universal uh, Whereas the Chinese uh, Communist Party, it's just moral, virtuous, you know, good person. Uh, filial, right? Nice to the parents and so on. Um, <laughs> this another is uh, meritocracy. And I wonder whether that okay is another sort of a systematic substitution for everything. Right. right. That's good. I'm going to um, now take uh, questions from all of you. Um, I have three people, and we can have more, of course. David, this gentleman, and the woman behind, and somebody had. Uh, uh, and there, and there, and Adrian. So David, take it away. Um, uh, what I would like to uh, ask about is sort of the relationship to last month, uh, in which um, I think the previous opposition was that um, a system of laws is really going to be sort of the uh, neutral baseline in terms of which um, I guess political order can be um, uh, sort of called to order in, in sort of objective and um, what, uh, authorized way. Right? And, and what I guess it seems like all of you are sort of indicating <laughs> is that there's an alternative way of thinking about this, um, and, and namely in, <clears throat> in thinking through the way in which some kind of, or that, that any political order, uh, I guess you, a couple of you quoted Schmidt's constitutional theory, it indicated that any political order necessarily has some kind of hierarchy, and that that hierarchy itself, um, in a sense, sense, constitutes the order, and really would, would, would in a sense, be the, the, the uh, what would, would set up the parameters for laws to even have meaning. Um, <clears throat> and then within that, the you, you, you're, well, at least certainly Shudong and Andrea are identifying, I guess it's certainly John, are identifying a kind of uh, particular like the aristocracy or the party as, um, I guess, the, the kind of representational form of the, of the people uh, that would have the, the, the kind of authority that the people grants to that, to that group, right? And, and there's a kind of and I think a couple of you indicated kind of representational dynamic, right? Where it says you've got the, the there's a there's a representational authority that one of the groups has that in a sense um, causes it to embody the people to themselves as what the people should be, right? And so that, that would be a, a kind of representational dynamic that would replace, I guess, laws as that which provides the kind of ultimate authority for grounding the group board. And I guess um, so the, the question is, well, so is, is this primarily a representational dynamic? And then second, you know, how does, you know, how does, how does change come about here, right? Do we, do, are we stuck with a kind of party, right? Are we stuck with an aristocracy? Is there a kind of, 
you know, um, place where the where the people get to like actually say something rather than just be represented by this uh, by this this whatever group. I may I can take a take on that discussion first. There is always a constitutional tension between the Chinese Communist Party's party charter, Daozhang, and the Chinese Constitution. So, which is the oh, the basic basic law? Which so supersedes which when there is a constitutional crisis? It's in an informal sense, it's, it's impossible to even to start thinking so this kind of a mess, this legal and traditional mess. However, if you look at the Communist Party Charter, and it, in ideal terms, you know, in an ideal world, and if you, you take their own words uh, on face value, it says the Communist Party, by definition, is to to fade away. It's the, the, the political effort to create a socialist state is for this state to, to disappear, right? That's the very definition of, a, of socialist revolution, right? The proletarian intervention is to uh, liberate everybody so that there's no class society. Therefore, this political state, on the basis of a class society, would uh, manage along with them. And these are my, my being, uh, scholastic in nature, but if we take it seriously for a moment, it basically says something like, no, the Chinese constitution is the solution of a prior historical situation, which constitutes a concrete political situation, and that the Chinese constitution is answer. But it's an answer in a strictly political sense. It's all of the life and death struggle for national survival and all that, culture, tradition, race. There was a, in Lei Qing moment, there was Rampant discussion on the distinction of the yellow race right, uh, at the hands of imperialism. But this political solution requires or awaits a certain kind of concrete socio economic development, like what our first uh, keynote speaker talked about. Started with property rights, private law, you know, eigentum, this very bourgeois notion of, uh, 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 of the self, property rights. It was simply not there because you're looking at this uh, peasant uh, 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 nation, uh, uh, illiteracy, you know, lack of political parties, lack of a basic institutional setup. So therefore, I think the Chinese constitution is a, an abstract framework which guarantees, which lays out and, and protects this uh, political sphere waiting for concrete historical substance to fill in the blank. To fill the uh, to to fill the void in concrete economic, cultural, social, legal terms. So it's a placeholder in this particular sense uh, that always capable of renewal, uh, reinvention, and the original moment, the original moment in the form of the province. I'm, to make sure that we get as many questions as possible, I'm going to. Okay, the next question, which is you. Yeah, I, I, I sort of divided in, in two parts. Um, the, the first three, I, I'm looking at the tension between, I'll uh, say, the nobility and, and the masses, or, or the elites and the masses. And if the masses are superior, does that not, in a way, free the elites or the nobility uh, and give them license? to operate without no less oblige and obligation to the masses. And does that really cut them loose? I mean, uh, look what's happening in China today. You know, uh, billionaires uh, just emerging all over the place. Uh, it's, uh, and look what liberty, equality, fraternity uh, has gotten in France as some of the, the greatest income inequality in Europe, <laughs> in Western Europe anyhow, uh, more like the US than, than uh, the more modern. And, and for the last person, for Australia, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, it, our, if we go from the House of Lords in Britain to the American Senate, to the Australian Senate, 
Are we going steadily downhill? <laughs> In terms of uh, an obstructionist force uh, 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 blocking uh, uh, the progress of the state. Well, the Australian Senate is probably the American Senate, so uh, I mean, the, the, the curious thing is, is uh, the reason why they had the Nexus, for example, uh, was because they believed that the American Senate had to, had certain, had, it was powerful, but it had other things, so they needed to bolster the power of the, the Australian Senate, so it was like the American Senate. Part of, part of the problem here is the electoral system, as much as anything else. But that it does raise issues about uh, generally under under a lot of a lot of countries the the upper house is a house of review is this powerful so if you're going to make two houses and the set the upper house is going to be very powerful then you've got to expect that this going to be obstruction simple as that as for the sort of the kind of the patrician Canadian kind of tension I would say. Um, there, like you know, with my limited exposure of this this issue, I think there is. I haven't read anything about one aristocracy that would uh, advocate um, the elimination of poor. You know, the elimination thing is rather the other way around, right? I mean, with, with the Soviets, with the modern sort of you know class struggle idea that it, that's that's the beginning. Uh, you know, uh, or you know. I don't know. You know, there are other cases, I guess, uh, uh, where 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 uh, you know you you, you 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 somehow may foresee the the, the winding out of the uh, um, And And uh, Aristotle is all about moderation. It's very strange. Um, like even the warlords in China, right? I mean, if you look back look back at the Republic history, the warlords were very enthusiastic about you know like accepting schools, spreading the, the good Confucian you know <laughs> teaching, whatever. I mean, they were very eager to embrace culture and all that. Even the warlords. Um, um, so, so I mean, warlords were probably the, the worst kind of aristocrats. I mean, they have the power, but you know, somehow, somehow they, they do not have culture, right? Um, but uh, uh, so, so in some ways, I, I, I really, I hope I'm not answering um, the, you know Andrew's question in the in the spirit of um, the Judge Sleet's um, joke. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, 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 sort of this this measured life, this this unique life form, uh, somehow. Um, is not all with us anymore, but um, um, it does, uh, I think, represent some kind of a, a strange attraction. You sort of intellectually, it is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thing to contemplate, right? So, so um, but what is the, the real, real deal? Expropriation uh, of the poor or the poor's appropriation of, of the rich uh, or the powerful? The dynamic is, is rather um, uh, less explored, I would say. I just wanted to add um, one thing to that strand of the question. It struck me um, in your question that you said uh, if the masses are superior, and one of the things that, I, that running through my talk and, and in some of the comments already, I think, um, is uh, not that, and, and, and in the substance of my talk, it's, it's not that the people are superior, it's that that's what there is. Like, that is the nation. It's not a better than, it's that is it. Um, and so one of the things that, um, I've been thinking about through this project is the way in which um, the language of supremacy belongs first to the aristocracy. So there's this moderating effect, but um, at least in the example of the French aristocracy, um, like Hannah Arendt will point out that that will be the first group of people um, to invent, invent a kind of race thinking before race. So they'll say that our origin is not that of the peasants. In fact, it's this like we're from the like Frankish tribes. Um, so I think I think that question about supremacy, um, if we flip it, it might give us more material to think about uh, aristocratic remainders and in modes that are extra national. So often the aristocracy acts like a nation within a nation, um, but I think it might also be defining itself as a, a race within a nation and have investment in separation. In the Chinese context, uh, with this invisible unwritten contract, is there a human right that stands out as basically um, affirming the individual in some way? And, and I'm, I'm just wondering, if, uh, again, of, of, of the rights that might be uh, stifled in some way, is there one that, that comes out on uh, dignity um, uh, in, in the United States, probably freedom of expression, freedom of speech, 
But in, in the current uh, uh, Chinese con uh, context, is there something that, that, that stands out in some way as a human right uh, that, uh, uh, again, emerges from this unwritten contract? Again, the short answer is no. <laughs> but and the longer answer is that yes, no. Because uh, they, they, when it comes to human rights, the state discourse always puts its emphasis on the collective human rights, survival, prosperity, communal and collective in nature. But uh, along with the rise of urban middle class, which defines Chinese reality right now, I think uh, there is a sort of a, uh, uh, a, a concurrent movement uh, not as official as the, the first one, trying to make local situation more tolerable or more promising. Uh, you know, this consciousness of rights, home ownership, for instance, right? And then the freedom of expression even in certain, uh, uh, again, local uh, uh, situations. As long as it's not directly challenges the legitimacy of the Communist Party move, it's it's always good, it's, it's encouraged, but, it's, but not if it becomes political or even constitutional, that will be suppressed ruthlessly. So that's I can when it comes to China. Um, this gentleman, yes. You had your hand up. Yes. No, the person behind you, sorry. Thank you. On the notion of politics, can we um, in current situation, there is a harsh confrontation between the democracy and the constitutionalism. Um, two um, sides are um, trying to um, think of the promise in a long way, but in a different way. So, I think this question of the promise in constitution, embedded in constitution, but only in China, but also in other. Different. Sometimes confrontating uh, <coughs> both. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It's very different. It's in, in this particular Chinese case, the promise is always dif differentiated. It comes with a different set of priorities. The first priority is always, for instance, economic development, right? We have to feed you well, we have to give you, you know, med medicine, all, and literacy, and then it comes maybe social freedom, then it comes political freedom, which not right now, that's considered a luxury, that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's, but in other national situations, the priority might be very different. I'd like to further develop the Sultan's question, I think. Um, I would say the Chinese governments, and between sort of, you know, the, the liberal, sort of constitutionalism on the one hand and sort of democracy on the other, I think cannot switch against the idea of democracy, but definitely uh, not the, you know, the thing, right? The, 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 this kind of liberal, liberal, uh, sort of the, the constitutional kind of a, a process, I think. Uh, uh, it's, it's wasteful, considered, uh, you know, in terms of time, money, whatever, investment, um, it's not, you know, responding to rapidly changing realities in China. Um, uh, or it's not, it's not considered fit. I think that that's the, the overall, but I don't think there is a sort of, you know, like this uh, inbuilt um, uh, uh, hostility toward um, you know, democracy as is, sort of the, the, you know, because in somehow, in this abstract way, uh, the party is ruling the nation as, as uh, with, with some kind of like the will or something. Uh, so each of you sort of uh, posited different person or group of people who are part of this change, this perpetual constitutionalism. Uh, you know, sitting politicians, essayists and uh, intellectuals, the party, uh, poets and cultural elites. How do you think that sort of the class or group origin of the people who you're talking about engaging in this process of constitutional change or interpretation affects the kind of constitutional change or interpretation you're discussing? I'd better shut up. I quite get your point. Sorry. So, so each each of you seem to look at a different group of people engaging in the project, or the kind of person engaging in the project of perpetual constitutionalism. You had you know poets and intellectuals, sitting politicians, essayists and revolutionists. How does the origin of that that person or their sort of particular allegiance affect the way? 
they engaged in this process of reinterpreting or altering the, the constitutional system they were part of? Mine is probably the easiest to answer because, uh, like, and then well, says yes, it's the other yes. yes. So I think that, uh, I mean, that's the easiest question, in the, I think, to answer in that respect because in the, uh, the description that I gave in the beginning, it's easy, or we have a way of accounting for where a theological impulse relocates in the formation of the state, and of course, CS himself, the Abbe, CS, will go on to represent the third estate, even though he's of the first estate. So that's that would be the, I think, the, the easy answer to your question. Um, the way that I would maybe make that question more difficult for myself would be to look in the afterlives of the people who handled that question. So I, I cited um, Gabriel Tard, who, talking about the aristocracy, will say that um, they discover equality first. And he'll say that they do that in um, getting rid of the minor distinctions between the different, the different ranks of nobility. It's like a perverse <laughs> argument. Um, to suggest that the, the aristocracy invented and then the people imitate it. So I think that would be one place where I would look, uh, would be following the thread of social science, um, early social science to ask uh, how it, it absorbs an aristocratic function. I think that's been repressed a little bit and in the um, makeover to some scene of Tard in the hands of people like Deleuze or Latour, um, I think that that strand has sometimes been lost. Uh, I'm the only <laughs> I uh, just want to make sure we cover our questions and we have this gentleman and then Adrian. Okay, so this is for uh, Andrea. Uh, uh, I, I thank you. Um, but I have a question which simply put is, well, what is the second state? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so here's my thought. Um, one way to understand what you were saying is um, you were tracking the political slash revolutionary critique of representation. Yes. Um, so uh, you confront a representational claim, and, and, and you negate it. You say, actually, you're not speaking for anyone. Um, uh, you don't stand for anyone. Um, it's just, uh, you know, uh, you collapse representation to itself. You may be speaking, mm -hmm. but you're not saying anything. Right. Um, uh, and because there's nobody, uh, uh, you're disqualified from representation. Uh, and, there, and therefore, then, and how do you then describe this thing that was a representational claim, right. you made a thing, right? Um, you're not representing, you're simply uh, you know, a, a virus or a, 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 a plant, whatever, whatever. So but the question then is, um, are you identifying the political response to the claim of representation, mm -hmm. uh, or did the second estate make a representational claim? Uh, that it's easy enough to reduce your opposition by describing them as representational, but failing. Uh, but were they thinking of themselves already? But because for them to think of themselves as representational is to say that they understood that sovereignty lay elsewhere, that it was the people uh, that they had to represent. And then when you say, well, they actually made a, a claim about race and origins, yeah. that suggests to me that maybe they weren't making a representational claim. Uh, and then uh, your remark just now about uh, equality, discovery of equality, that sounds to the English American lawyer uh, very much like the American uh, and, and that's not a representational claim. That's just a claim about interests, right? We're not representing anybody. We have a set of interests through negotiating uh, with the king. So, what's the second state? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me let me try to not answer your question in in, in the following way. Well, so first, um, I'm intrigued by the path that you open up about interests. Uh, and in the talk last night, I wanted to think about political emotion because it seemed like the talk split up political feeling into two modes: resentment and interest, which was sapped of it. Like it sounded cerebral, but uh, like we know that the passions and the interest and the interest is one of them. I think what I'm describing is a kind of negative politics, uh, which is part of my language struggle, but. Um, my like, my response for the person who was going to answer this question, which I feared, um, was to return to the idea of representation without presentation, uh, and to defer the question or to open up the question into thinking about excrescence. I'm sorry to do this, but um, when I when I looked to see if anybody talked about representation without presentation, on the one hand, I found like people who want to talk about the simulacrum, which is, is not what I'm talking about, but there there is this sort of like there's nothing and then there's illusions and copies. 
that's useful to me to the extent that I want to think about ideology, but that doesn't answer my question. Um, but I have stumbled upon um, the idea of excrescence and representation without presentation in like half of a sentence by Badu, like talking about politics. I think that uh, it, Badu himself wasn't that interesting to me in spelling out what that meant, but it led me to return to the section of um, Marx talking about the civil war in France and talking about uh, a parasitic excrescence that is the like the bad state coming from without. So I think that um, I think I'm working towards something like saying that the structure of the state is the second estate until we find a better state. But I'm I'm unwilling to commit to it publicly. So I say that, um, under under erasure, if you will. Thank you. Thank you for the question, though. I um, I have to intervene because otherwise we will not get our hallowed coffee. <laughs> and so I'd like one more time to thank all the panelists.